So turning to Takis and Andres. So um, Andres Monroy Hernandez is a postdoc researcher at Microsoft Research and um, Takis Metaxas is a professor of computer science and founder of the Media Arts and Science program at Wellesley College. And we have the privilege of having them um, speak to us about a paper that they have co-authored um, that they have been presenting on narco tweets and the um, use of social media in the Mexican drug war. And so we're um, excited to welcome them both. I believe that they're open to questions throughout the presentation. So uh, please feel free to interrupt. We want to make this a really discussion-oriented uh, conversation as they share our work with us and lead a discussion. Um, and the hashtag, so if you want to tweet about it, is hashtag narco tweets. Welcome, thanks, Andres. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, don't have to clap yet. <laughs> um, so uh, the topic of today is going to be uh, this. Um, we're we are analyzing how people are using social media in uh, moments of crisis, in particular uh, during wartime. And we focus on the case of Mexico. Uh, so I just wanted to say that this is uh, both uh, work in progress and published work. So Takis and I uh, and, and our collaborators at Wellesley and Microsoft Research, uh, we recently published this on a conference called ICWSM. But it's also part, part of this work is uh, coming out in uh, future venues as well. Actually two papers. Yeah, two papers, yeah. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to kind of set the tone of this conversation. And you know, there's been a lot of debate about the role of social media in uh, promoting or supporting civic engagement. So uh, as you, you might remember uh, when the Arab Spring was in full speed, uh, you know, Clay Shirky and, uh, and Malcolm Gladwell got into this debate uh, about you know, what, what was the role of social media and so on. So our hope is that this could add to this discussion. Um, so I'm just going to give an outline of our presentation. So first, we're going to you know, provide context of what is the phenomena that we are observing. And then we're going go to dive deeper into the different analysis that we did of the Twitter sphere in Mexico. Um, so first, uh, the Mexican drug war. So first of all, I just wanted to say you know, that the, the drug war in Mexico is a slightly, it's a slightly different concept than what we think of the drug war here. Uh, it's not just a policy. It's also an actual war. It's an armed conflict. Uh, so this conflict started around 2006, um, and uh, and some people, you know, they they, they, they uh, some people, some researchers have said that the drug war should not be considered a domestic insurgency, uh, that it should be instead classified as a non-international armed conflict. Um, so again, trying to set the context of this, which is actually we're talking actually about an armed conflict happening in primarily urban areas in Mexico. Um, so again, to give some context, uh, the numbers of people who have died in the drug war are contested, as you can imagine. But these are some numbers that were released at the end of last year. Uh, so there, were, there are about 60,000 people that have been killed. There are about 230,000 people that have been displaced uh, because of the violence. And you can see here in this, in this chart uh, you know, how the violence started to pick up around 2006, which is when uh, President Calderon took office. And you know, he changed the, the policies and, and the, the way he was going to fight uh, the, the, the drug war. Uh, so you can see this is the, the uh, rate of homicides uh, per, per month, actually. So you can see how it kind of continues to go up and a uh, uh, worrisome rate. Um, now, just to give you an idea of what this looks like, uh, you know, crises in, in, in Mexico, in many cities of Mexico, are part of everyday life. There are shootings, there are grenade attacks, there are car bombs, all sorts of things that are, you know, happening uh, in people's neighborhoods, uh, in the streets, etc. Uh, it's not just uh, in some areas of the city, it's uh, generalized in many different areas of, of the, the cities that have this, this problem. Um, so again, crises are part of everyday life. Uh, and now, you know, the war is not just a war of, you know, bullets, it's also a war of information. Uh, and, you know, there is a lot of um, tension around, you know, what kind of information can and should be released. Uh, typically, when there are emergencies in a country like the U.S., you have situations like this. You know, if there is a shooting or if there is a natural disaster, there is a, a government uh, there. Uh, the, and this is a role typically known as the public information officer. And these are people who are, you know, part of the government and part of the kind of emergency response team that tries to talk to the media. Uh, so we have these two kind of elements of the information flow during crisis in, in, in places that are uh, not at war. Uh, however, in Mexico, as we see in this report on the Washington Post, uh, journalists, uh, the media is not able to, to do the job. And here I'm going to quote, it says, fearing for their lives and safety of their families, journalists are adhering to a near complete news blackout under strict orders of drug smuggling, or smuggling organizations and their enforcers uh, who dictate via uh, daily telephone calls, emails, and news releases what can and cannot be printed or air. 
So again, you know, the, the challenge here is that the journalists cannot do their job because they're being threatened by, by, uh, by the cartels and sometimes even by the government. Uh, similarly, the government itself also is a victim of this, um, of this news blackout. And here I'm going to quote again. Uh, he says, the news blackout extends to government officials. Uh, and then they mentioned the case of Nuevo Laredo. Uh, in, the, in the city of Nuevo Laredo, the mayor mysteriously disappears for days and refuses to discuss drug violence. Uh, the military general who uh, presides over the soldiers patrolling the city does not hold news conferences, issue statements, or answer questions from the media. So this is kind of the, the environment in which uh, this is happening. So if you think of uh, the, the image that I showed before where you have the government and the media, you can see that both of these entities, both of these institutions are weakened by, by the war. Um, now, uh, social media has played an important role in this information war, as we called it, uh, and I'm going to describe uh, why. Uh, first of all, uh, internet penetration in Mexico has increased uh, dramatically in the past few years. Um, so now you can find internet and tacos at the same time. Uh, the number of users uh, in Mexico uh, grew from 17% of the population to 34% of the population in 2010, and now you can imagine it's, it's a lot more. Um, now, in terms of social media use, 61% uh, of those internet users are users of social media sites, from Facebook to Twitter to YouTube, et cetera. Um, of those people who use social media, about 20% are active participants on Twitter. Um, and in fact, uh, I just saw a report from the Oxford Internet Institute uh, from last week that showed that Mexico is the fifth largest country in terms of Twitter production of knowledge. Um, so that's the, the environment. And so when you have uh, this intersection of you know, weakened institutions, you know, the media and the government, you have uh, increased violence, and you have uh, an increased adoption of social media, what you have is the following. Um, you know, we started to see tweets like this one. Uh, I'm going to translate this to Spanish, to English. Um, so very, the, the tweet says, you know, caution on Lázaro Cárdenas Avenue around Del Paseo. Uh, people report a recent risky situation, which is a euphemism for a shooting or a grenade attack. Uh, and then they add these hashtags like MTY follow. MTY is the uh, code for the airport of the city of Monterey. And then follow, kind of an invitation to follow this hashtag. And then also risk uh, Monterey. And then a timestamp that some people add to their tweets. So, so th what we are seeing is that people are using Twitter as a way of alerting other people of which areas of the city to avoid, uh, what is happening in the cities, because the media either is not reporting this, or when they do report it, they report it at such a slow pace, and they wait for, so, for, for, for many hours or even days that it's no longer useful information. What a lot of people do, a lot of the people that I know in, in some of the cities in Mexico, for, for example, before they leave home or before they leave their office, they check on Twitter on which areas of the city to avoid, kind of like a traffic report. Uh, so so that's, that's what we are seeing. And I just want to make, make sure that uh, we understand that Twitter is just part of an ecology of uh, different information systems. It's not the only one. It's the one we studied in this case. But there is YouTube, there is email, there is Facebook, and there is also traditional uh, medium uh, like you know, the cell phone, uh, even face-to-face -face communication, as well as the media, despite the fact that it's being you know, threatened, there's still a lot of journalists who are doing their job or at least try to do their job. Uh, so just want to make uh, sure that that's uh, what we're studying, but it's also part of an ecology. Now, what we, are, what we did is uh, we looked at four different cities in Mexico where uh, this intersection of uh, high violence, high uh, internet penetration, and, uh, and weak institutions uh, ha happened to converge. So the first one is Monterey, the city of the size of uh, the greater metropolitan area of Boston. is four million people. Uh, then there's the city of Reynosa, which is a border city. Um, then the city of Veracruz, uh, a city in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, and the city of Saltillo, uh, which is uh, very close to Monterey. Uh, so just to give you an idea, the, the, the city of Boston, just the city of Boston, is about 600,000 people. The greater Boston area is uh, 4.5 million people. So just to uh, set the, the, the dimensions um, in your head. Um, this is where the cities are located. You know, uh, number one is Monterey, two Saltillo, three Reynosa, and four Veracruz. So what we did is we looked at, first of all, we wanted to understand you know, how many tweets are there. You know, we've been hearing and, and seeing uh, on Twitter that there are people doing this. But we wanted to get a sense of how many of these tweets there were. Um, so if we looked at all the tweets that were uh, posted uh, from August 2010 until uh, November 2011. And there were about uh, 600,000 tweets uh, posted with particular hashtags. Uh, so each city has organically developed hashtags that are used to report the violence. 
Uh, so we look only at one of those hashtags per city, and this is the numbers that we got. Uh, there are more hashtags that emerge, and you know, people compete for attention on different hashtags. But just to make the, the analysis simpler, we looked at one hashtag per city. Uh, so again, Monterrey, Reynosa, Saltillo, and Veracruz. These are the hashtags, and the number of tweets you can see kind of corresponds to the size of, of the city. Um, you can see also the number of, of unique users who are contributing to these, to these uh, kind of communities of practice around the, the hashtag. Um, now, we also wanted to know what kind of tweets we have. Um, so, you know, as, as, if you use Twitter, there are kind of different kinds of interactions. There is like, something called retweet, which is like spreading a tweet uh, uh, to, your, to the people that, you follow, that follow you. There is also this thing called mentions, which kind of is mentioning somebody else in a tweet. Uh, and there are like, you know, de novo or original tweets. So we wanted to see, you know, what is the, the rate of, you know, dissemination via retweets and uh, interaction via uh, the, the mentions. And, and one thing we saw is that for most of the cities, uh, the retweets, uh, the dissemination, are the primary mode of, inter or of participation on these hashtags, which kind of, if you look back at the tweet that I showed you, that tweet will be posted by someone who perhaps is in the scene or who heard from someone that something happened, and everybody else kind of uh, retweets that, and, and they retweet a lot. Uh, just as a point of comparison, al although this is kind of almost comparing apples and oranges, um, we looked at... Uh, at tweets from the city of Seattle, for example, and the numbers reverse. So uh, we didn't look at a hashtag, we looked at all the tweets posted by people that said that they're from Seattle, and there were about 50% of them were mentions, uh, and 15% were retweets, so kind of the opposite type of uh, interaction. Again, we need to do a little more analysis into you know, looking at, you know, uh, comparing something similar, which will be perhaps the, comparing the, the number of tweets in the cities against the number of tweets with the hashtag. But just to give you an idea, that's what we're seeing. Um, now, you know, how often do people tweet? Uh, so what we did is that over the course of these uh, 15 months that we looked at, uh, we kind of tried to quantify the number of tweets uh, per day, uh, and this is what we found. Uh, so the top is Reynosa, then Monterrey, Saltillo, and Veracruz, and you can see that there are spikes, and the spikes are, you know, uh, they match with what we are seeing are, you know, major events. So for example, one of the biggest spikes in Reynosa uh, corresponds to some clashes that kill 47 people in one single day. Uh, in Monterey, the biggest spike corresponds to a massacre that happened in a casino where 52 people were killed in a fire uh, that some drug cartels uh, kind of uh, started. So you can see that this matches somewhat uh, well to, to some of the, the big events. One of the issues with studying this, this phenomena is that it is really hard to find the ground truth. As I was saying, you know, if you look at the media, you don't see the totality of what's happening. If you look at Twitter, well, you might also see some tweets that might not be true. So it's really hard to, to know what is true. But you know, if you look at each one of these spikes and you look kind of manually at the tweets that people are reporting, primarily they're reporting the same event. And then you, sometimes that matches to what you see on the media. Uh, one other thing that we see here is uh, this kind of stagger adoption. And uh, you can see that the kind of the volume of tweets uh, starts shifting or starts uh, kind of uh, moving uh, in this direction, and, and this kind of corresponds to the way the violence is spread uh, geographically in these cities. So you, we actually saw that, you know, the violence in Reynosa, if you look at, you know, uh, the numbers, uh, the official numbers, kind of started before at Monterey and, and so on. So you can see that this practice of using Twitter and using it to, in this way through hashtags and so on spreads as the violence spreads. Now we wanted to see also what are people tweeting. Uh, so we took a snapshot of uh, all the tweets from one of the cities, and we looked at you know, just the typical uh, word cloud where we wanted to see what are the most common words mentioned. Uh, so you see the biggest word there is the word balacera, which means shooting in Spanish. Uh, and then there are words like reportan, which is report, precaution, uh, detonaciones, which is like blasts, and then also names of, uh, uh, of parts of the city, like Garza, which is a common uh, last name in, in the city, which also corresponds to a big street in, in, in the city of Monterrey, uh, and Guadalupe, which is a, one of the municipalities in the city. So you can see that there is a lot of, um, of words that refer to events, as well as location of those events. Um, so what, again, kind of putting this into a different uh, format, we kind of looked at uh, the most common words, and we kind of looked at the frequency of those words. And you can see the order of these words. Primarily, what we see is descriptions of places, uh, then uh, references to violence, shootings in particular, uh, then references to some version of the word report in Spanish, and then references to people um, that, we also, that we also see in, in this, in this uh, 
corpus of, of data. Now, uh, one of the things that we also wanted to see is, you know, who is tweeting all this? Um, is it, you know, 10, per 10 people or, or, you know, is it like, who, who are these people? Um, so what we did, uh, we looked at all of uh, each one of these cities and we mapped the number of tweets and the number of followers that each one of the people tweeting uh, kind of reports. So each one of the, the dots is a person. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, if we look at this person, you know, you will see that they have like 10 to the, I think it's 10 to the 3, which is like a thousand uh, tweets, and then 10 to the 4, about uh, like 10,000 followers. So you can see that this is, basically what we try to identify is different groups of people. Uh, so these are people, for example, that tweet very little, but have a lot of followers. And this is important because it helps us identify different kind of uh, groups of people. So, you know, again, this is the, the group of people who tweet very little, but have a lot of followers. And this is the group of people who kind of tweet an average number of tweets and don't have that many followers, you know, the average citizen. And these are the people who uh, are tweeting a lot and also have a lot of followers. So when we looked at uh, trying to identify some of these people, for example, one of the accounts there is CNN in Spanish. So they, when, when they were reporting the casino massacre, they used the hashtag MTYFollow, and, and that kind of uh, set was you know, represented here. Uh, we grabbed the number of tweets at the end of our kind of uh, computation and also the number of followers at the end of, of the kind of the sample that we did. So it's possible that some of these people started with you know, zero followers and then at the end they had many followers. Uh, then these are the average citizens and then what we call the curators. And basically what the curators are doing, they are spending a lot of time on Twitter. They're browsing through all the tweets that they read with the hashtag of their city. And they, when they recognize that multiple people are reporting the same thing, they broadcast this, this event to their followers. So these people gain a lot of reputation for doing this. And as you can see, they have a lot of followers. Uh, some, uh, some of them have like more than 100,000 followers and so on. Uh, so they're very influential or very powerful people in the tourist sphere in, in their city. Uh, they have a, a wide reach and also people kind of trust them uh, through their, their follows. Um, so we try to you know, identify some of these people. And it's really hard to talk to them. As you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, the, the situation in Mexico is quite complicated. And, and uh, there has been some attacks on, on, on people who are on social media. So they, they're very careful of, of who they talk to and what they talk about. So we, were, we reached to a couple of them. Uh, and not many reply, but uh, uh, three of them uh, reply, and they accepted to be interviewed. Uh, I interviewed them over Skype. So one of them over Skype, the other one over kind of a chat, live chat, and the other one through email. So I'm going to focus on two interviews that I did. One with Angela, uh, this is a fake name, obviously, and the other one with Claudia, also a fake name, a fake photograph. Uh, and um, so, so basically, um, Angela, in this case, uh, is, a, is a woman who, well, at least self-reports as a woman. Um, who has 25,000 followers, uh, she has tweeted 35,000 times. She spends, according to her, about 15 hours per day on Twitter, which is quite a lot. Uh, she's in her early 20s. Um, and then Claudia, uh, she has about 30,000 followers. Uh, she has tweeted about 60,000 times, a lot more. Uh, and she, when, when I asked her how much time do you spend on Twitter, she said many hours. Uh, she didn't say exactly how much. And she didn't say what her age was. Um, one of the interesting things is that a lot of the people that are in this kind of curator uh, category are uh, women. Uh, I didn't kind of examine that in a lot of detail, but I thought it was interesting that a lot of them are at least self-report as women. Um, I, all the interviews were conducted in Spanish, and I'm going to present to you the translations of this. So if there are any mistakes, it's my own uh, mistake. Uh, so first of all, I asked them, you know, how did you get started with Twitter? Um, so Angela, for example, she said, you know, it was through a friend. And then she said, uh, her friend said, uh, you have to uh, go to Twitter, it's so cool. Uh, she joined around 2009. Uh, for Claudia, it was a little different. She said, I joined by chance. I heard on the radio about how celebrities will interact with their fans. Uh, and she also joined around 2009. Uh, you can see the power of Justin Bieber perhaps uh, being a uh, place here. Um, then I asked her, how would you describe your role? Uh, and Angela said, you know, I'm a journalist. And then she says, it is as if I was a war correspondent on social networks of the war we are living in Mexico. I thought it was a kind of nice quote. She, she calls herself a war correspondent. Uh, for Claudia, she kind of uh, insists a lot on like, uh, her role uh, is that of another citizen. She kind of tries to not be 
or at least during the interview, tries to not be kind of a protagonist. So she says, I'm just another citizen. Uh, but also, she says that people tell her that she's like their angel for looking after them. So a lot of her followers, you know, they ask her, oh, I'm leaving work. Well, is this street safe or not? Or, you know, they, they have uh, this established relationship over the course of several weeks or months that they kind of interact. Um, I also wanted to learn about their motivations. So the, the motivations kind of did, came uh, not out of a particular question, but out of the whole discussion that we had. Uh, so for Angela, for example, she says, uh, I consider this as a community service, even though people might laugh about it. And she kept insisting on this, like, it's something really serious, but at the same time, you know, maybe my friends are making fun of this, or, you know, it's, it, even though you might not think it's serious enough, it is actually serious, and I think of it as, as an altruistic kind of participation. And for Claudia, she actually referred to the word altruism. She said, tweeting is an altruistic community service. Uh, so you, know, you can see the similarities in, in the responses. Uh, and then I also asked her, what are their sources? I really wanted to know where they get their information. Uh, so for Angela, uh, she says, not all the information comes from Twitter. Uh, there is a lot of people who know what I do. They have my number, and they call me. They're 100% citizens. And then she explained how uh, you know, people in the city know her, uh, at least some people, and that uh, you know, she has contacts with people uh, in the police department or the fire department or friends who live across the city. So when she hears a report, either on, on, on Twitter or that somebody calls her, she often tries to do some kind of triangulation. So she will call a friend of a friend whose grandmother lives by that neighborhood and says, you know, are, you least, are you hearing any, any blast or anything? So that's kind of the way she tries to to confirm that the information is true or not. Uh, for Claudia, uh, she says most of the information comes from Los Twitteros, which is a common term people use in Mexico to refer to the, to the Twitter sphere. Uh, and and uh, so she says, my followers are the ones who send me the information. And then, interestingly enough, she says, in other cases, it's the reporters on TV or the local news. Uh, so you can see that despite the fact that, yes, uh, institutions are weak, the media is weak, they still play a role in this kind of information ecosystem. And, and a lot of the, the tweets and retweets that people send are links to articles or, or links to news reports. Uh, one of the things that, uh, actually, I, I think this comes in later. Um, one of the things that I asked them uh, was also, you know, what are your opinions on mainstream media? So Angela said, for example, uh, sorry, for Claudia, she said, you know, when I started, the news media, the journalists, and the government were non-existent. They did not report, they did not inform what was happening on the streets. Uh, so that was kind of a complaint that I also heard from Angela. She says, you know, the media, they forgot they have an obligation with the people. They started hiding information. Then society started demanding information, and this is when social networks took over. Uh, so we start seeing this, this uh, similar uh, articulation of, you know, why they, they are doing what they do and the way they see the mainstream media. Now I asked them also, what are your opinions on social media? Um, so Angela says, you know, social media is more pure. Uh, so, for example, she says, when a piece uh, of news gets to TV or newspaper, it gets mishandled. Uh, she often talked about how she sees events and people report things, and then by the time these events are reported in the media, they get changed so much that they're not truthful to what actually happened. Um, so, uh, social media, she claims, is, is pure. Uh, similarly, uh, Claudia says, you know, social media is very important because of the speed at which uh, one can reach people and the veracity and because it's altruistic. So again, kind of pu the purity of social media in, in a way kind of expressed in these, in these quotes. Uh, so one of the things to, to, to note here is also that they do acknowledge that the media uh, reports things, as, as I was uh, saying, but um, they, they, th there are two challenges with the mainstream media. One is the speed, and the other one is you know, the, how truthful it is. Um, Last, uh, one of the things that I asked them, you know, what will you change of this system? Or what will you change of Twitter or social media in general? What are the challenges that you see? Um, so as a designer of technology, I was really interested in this, in this question uh, to see what we could do. Uh, so one of the things that Angela said is that uh, she's worried about people uh, stealing her tweets. So she says, uh, it sounds silly, uh, but it's just that I am against uh, the stealing of tweets. As I thought it was interesting, uh, because I've been doing a lot of work on uh, intellectual property in a completely different uh, setting, and I thought it was interesting to see this also happening in this, in this space. For Claudia also, she says, you know, I do not like that people often do not give credit in my retweets of my tweets. So from what they told me is that oftentimes somebody reads their tweets, and then they kind of copy, paste them, and then put them with a different timestamp on the tweet, not on the kind of official timestamp. So oftentimes what people do is that they report some event, and they add a, a timestamp on what, what time that event happened. 
So it's not necessarily when you are tweeting that, but when that event happened. And then apparently people sometimes change that to claim that they knew about this event earlier. Uh, so you can see that there is a, a lot of tension around the ownership of this information. And despite the fact that these people are you know, altruistic and doing this for, for the greater good, they still want to get credit for their work. They still want to be recognized. There were two other issues around ethics and morality that they mentioned. The first one that Angela mentioned is that you know, Twitter verifies accounts that harm society. So I asked her more about this, and what she says is that you know, she sees that a lot of the Twitter accounts that are verified by Twitter are from mainstream media, a lot of media that she recognizes as you know, harmful for society, and she kind of gets upset that Twitter is endorsing this. Now, if you ask Twitter, they will say that verification is not endorsement. It's just you know, a, a way of avoiding um, uh, duplicity or people claiming to be somebody else who, who they are not. Uh, but from the eyes of these people, at least this person, uh, the verification is actually a, a, a seal of endorsement. Similarly for Claudia, she complains about the quality of the hashtags, of the trending topics. And she says that uh, the ones that are promoted are often insulting. Uh, she says how some of them are demeaning to people or uh, racist or whatever. And again, if you ask Twitter, they will say, you know, trending topics are completely an automated process. It's uh, an algorithm that does this. Uh, however, these people are saying this is a, kind of a, some sort of endorsement. Um, now, one of the interesting things about the curators is that, you know, there are, these are just two of them, uh, is that this phenomena started to be recognized in the community outside Twitter. Uh, so there is a group of people in, in one of the cities that we looked at that started a nonprofit organization uh, called the Center of Citizen Integration or uh, Aggregation. And basically what they did is they tried to replicate what the curators are doing in a more official way. So they have offices, they have phone numbers, uh, they are public about who they are, and they basically are trying to aggregate all the information from Twitter, uh, from even short messages to phone calls, etc., and put them on a map using this system called Ushahidi that was developed in, in Kenya. Uh, so this is a really interesting uh, development where now kind of people are taking this kind of user innovation that they've seen on Twitter and kind of implementing it into a more formal uh, process. Uh, and then we start seeing this spreading to other places as well. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, let Takis uh, explore and explain to you some of the analysis that we did of the retweet networks of, of some of these curators. Thank you. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so uh, I am a computer scientist, and uh, I knew about the drug war in Mexico, but I did not have a particular interest in diving into it and trying to find out what was going on. However, I have an interest in um, another issue that has to do with trustworthiness of information we receive. How do you know what you know? How do you verify the information you're getting? And I've done some work looking at uh, uh, the way that the discussion about politics in the United States is being shaped. So when um, uh, Andres last year uh, told me about the collection of tweets that he was getting from there, I jumped into it. I said, I would like to see it. But he says, well, they are anonymous, which made me even more curious. Can anonymous accounts actually get any trustworthiness, any traction? And why on earth would you ever trust somebody anonymously, in particular when it comes to um, have your life depending on the information you receive? So that, that was kind of mind-boggling. So we started analyzing, and so I, I had two problems. First, that was the collection that uh, we got was huge, was in the hundreds of thousands of tweets. Uh, I don't want to read that many tweets. Number two, I don't speak Spanish. That was a serious problem, of course. So I thought, well, as a computer scientist, maybe we have some tools that would like to, to see. So I started looking at them as um, uh, a computer scientist. What you see here is a graph, and this graph represents the mutual friendships between members of a particular group in a particular city that we will call Greenville. Uh, it was a, thankfully, a very early decision that we made to use anonymity as well in everything we were doing, that uh, the question was that, yes, these accounts are anonymous that we're dealing with, but if at some point somebody finds out about some of those, they can be exposed, they can be in danger. So let's go with anonymous. So we did that. Now, this graph, interestingly enough, I did not you know, do it in purpose to look like a human brain. It does, uh, with uh, you know, five regions colored. I will explain. There are three different parameters drawn here. The first parameter is the proximity of the nodes, uh, how this algorithm works. Well. It, uh, it is looking, as I said, at mutual friendships on Twitter. How many of you are familiar with Twitter? 
So not everybody. In Twitter, it's not exactly like Facebook, in which the moment you become a friend of somebody else, they become a friend of you. Yeah, but, but it is, you can follow somebody, and only if they follow you, you have kind of closer relationship. All right? So mutual following means a greater degree of uh, friendship. So we looked at that particular city's um, Twitterers um, and, and, and see how much friendship, mutual uh, following that is, was among them. Whenever you see two nodes close by, means that they are connected by many other friends. And when you see them far apart, they are not connected by that many friends. So that was the proximity is one of the parameters. The second is the color. And the color is given by a different algorithm. This is an algorithm that tries to find subregions which happen to have more often connections between them than outside of this subregion. For example, for all of us here, if we were to draw a similar graph, those of you who happen to work on the same project and you get to see everybody every day, you will eventually get the same color versus others who are working on different projects. So in this one, it seems like we have like five different, at least, uh, subgroups connecting. Uh, actually, we do not draw in this graph every friendship, but only those that they have at least 75 mutual friends. And the third parameter is the size of the node. A node has a larger size if it has more friends with others. So you can see here that in this green sub uh, area, these nodes are having more friends than others. So again, you get this and you do not know anything yet about what they're talking, but you say, well, I can see communities in there. I can see that the communities are actually cooperating. They have this kind of friendships that you can do. To compare this against, let's say, the friendship you could find in the US of people tweeting about political issues. You will not see anything like that. You will actually see at least two different groups of people uh, kind of tweeting. As a matter of fact, we have drawn that in another place. And actually, you can see you know, the Democrats here, the Republicans here, all the liberals and the conservatives. And if you were to color them within the conservatives, for example, you would see a subgroup, which would be, say, the Tea Party. And all of this you could essentially extrapolate just by, by looking at the way they behave. So that was one interesting thing, made us look even further into that. The second thing that we looked at is the pattern of their communication, in particular the retweeting. For those of you not familiar with Twitter, retweeting is when you are transmitting the very same information without changing an iota. You just get a message and you send it to your followers, to those who are listening to you, and this is not yours. This is an act of trust in the information you're receiving in some sense. Somehow you want to inform others that you are believing that this has some value. It's not happening 100% of the times, but most of the time that's what happens. Again, if you were to see the, the political system, you would see something similar. So here is what we see. There are some clusters far away from the others. These are clusters we found out when we look closer to that, that they're referring to events like uh, um, uh, musicals or uh, some kind of uh, a cultural event that people were talking about or, you know, uh, famous personalities on TV and stuff like that. However, by and large, there is a very strong cluster in the, in the, sec in, in the middle and the size again means who is being retweeted. So think of that as the page rank algorithm that works on, on Google. Whenever you do a search on Google, the first few things that will come up on your web page are likely the ones that Google believes are the most important. We are drawing the very same thing here. And one of these nodes becomes particularly large, means that this node is being retweeted like crazy. And we have some smaller ones, 13, that they're kind of larger than the group, but some of them, they're quite larger. This is the picture throughout the period we are observing. All right? A project that we currently work in is how the shape of this communication is shaped over time. Were always people retweeting this node all the time or not? So that's the kind of thing that we got. And again, we have not read anything uh, of the tweets. However, these big nodes attracted our attention. You know, why on earth people 
tweet this node so much. All right, so we decided let's take a closer look at this node. Um, oh yes, I supposed to show you this when I was talking. So here is what I was talking about. All right, we started looking at this particular Twitter. We call this person Alex. We have no idea if it is a male or a female. We do not have any idea who's the real name of this person. We call this Alex. And so we show here in red the tweets of this very person and in blue the tweets of the community that they mentioned this person. So it's not surprising that the blue lines are much larger because you know the community essentially is referring to Alex much more often than Alex can you know, do it by himself. Make sense? And so a little uh, investigation here is important. You know, you see a graph like that. What does it tell me? Well, first you see the spikes. You wonder why you have the spikes. That's a curiosity you need to dig deeper. However, you also find that there is a correspondence between the spikes of Alex and the spikes of the followers. So somehow the community is following or is in sync with Alex, whatever it's doing. However, there is another pattern that we notice that we find particularly interesting. If you look overall how much Alex is talking about in this first period versus later on, you will see that Alex is becoming kind of more quiet down the road. He is talking less, which is weird. Um, the sampling we have gotten is always with the same mean, so it does not explain why at some point Alex starts talking less. His followers also start talking about Alex less as time goes. And interestingly enough, the separation between the two regions comes with a huge spike for Alex. So we look at this and we say, wait a minute, something, we're, we're told something here. Something is going on because Alex changes attitude and the community changes attitude and that happens after the community has a huge interest in Alex. All right? The deficit of not speaking Spanish, it gets, you know, more and more severe there. Um, but we thought maybe it has to do with particular events that are happening. So in particular, as Andres said, Balacera. This is about shooting. Let's see how what people are talking about corresponds to shooting events. Maybe that explains everything. And here is the interesting thing. We have divided the people who talk on Twitter in three groups. Those who will talk only rarely. They have altogether less than five tweets. This is the first picture you see here in blue. And next to it, we have the tweets referred to Balacera in purple. And an interesting observation right there between these two is that blue and purple are quite correlated. You know, when one goes up, the other goes up. When one goes down, the other goes down. So these people who rarely talk, by and large, they might be talking about shootings. That's interesting. Now, we go into the next group. This is the green group, which is the group that's talking a bit. These are people that they had five to 100 tweets. And indeed, we see that in the beginning, this group, the green group, follows what Balacera is doing. But up from a point later on, they're talking more and does not always follow the spikes in Balacera. So this group actually is interested in something else after that. And to make things even more you know, suspenseful, those who are talking a lot, they have 100 or more, which is the blue, which you see them very low in the beginning, here are talking a lot. And the other observation is that the change, by the way, this dip is just meaning really that we don't have data for that particular date. It's not, if you were to just follow the lines, you would you know, see that the transition is smooth. It's not like things are going suddenly dead and then going up. So the dates that we see here correspond to the dates that uh, our friend Alex was talking before and after. So the whole thing becomes really darn interesting. And we realize that something is happening in the community around that time. Those talkative people talk even more. There is an interest in Alex. And after that, you know, the interest in Alex persists for a while. Uh, the, the interest of the community persists for a while, but Alex is not participating in that. This is where we give in and we start hiring students who speak Spanish and we start saying, okay, 
here is this time, you know, these 10, 12 tweets, tell us what they say, and so on and so forth. So instead of trying to read everything, we just focus on those that they have something interesting to say. And here is what we find. Here is what we find. Here's the picture I showed you before. It turns out that in the beginning of the data collection we have, we find out that our curator's account is being hacked. It's one of the three accounts, actually, our curator is using. So this is what's happening right there. Um, why somebody would want to actually hack the account of that? It could happen accidentally, but from the tweets we realized it did not happen accidentally. We actually, beyond this data, we started going back and we find several repositories of tweets and we start sampling there. We find out that the tag that actually created all of this data was created about eight months before these events. And it happened from a random person, somebody who cared about the community. But Alex started getting, um, using a lot of these hashtags in a very effective way. That is, people appreciated the way he was using it. And he becomes prominent. Suddenly, he gets into the tens of thousands of followers. So people suddenly start following, start following Alex. So we're thinking maybe there is some kind of animosity or jealousy towards Alex. We'll see what's going on. It turns out also that Alex is trying actually, is a, is a rather idealistic person because he's trying actually to create a larger event behind all of these things. He's trying actually to say, as Mexicans, as a big community, we have to do something about the narco war. Later on, we find that actually the attacks of Alex do not end. There is a fake Alex that starts ridiculing this guy and try to ridicule him. We find, however, that within a few weeks period, this account is being shut down by Twitter because the community starts reporting this fake account as spam to Twitter. And Twitter, you know, has this kind of automatic algorithms that if a lot of people complain about a particular uh, behavior, then they will shut them down. So here you have a community actually rallying around Alex to try to shut down this fake account. Pretty interesting. Well, what happened in between? We, we were looking essentially at the um, eight top picks here to see what people were talking about instead of trying, you know, just going with the surgical accuracy and you say what they were talking that day, what they were talking about that other day. Um, it turns out that halfway in between, some major events were happening in Greenfield a lot of slaughtering is happening and people are really getting really upset in between. Um, so it turns out that Alex actually tries to do something about that and it's doing something really major. He's trying to organize in a very um, formal way a group of informants. We found actually a large number, you know, into the um, tens, in the dozens of accounts that they were created on the call, apparently, of Alex trying to give information. So all of this explains the, uh, you know, the role that Alex is playing, explains what he's doing, how he's doing it. There is, however, a major event that happens just before this spike. Alex is being accused as actually working for one of the cartels. And you can just imagine the, the um, response of the society. In the beginning, they would not want to think of that. But after a while, Alex stays quiet for reasons we do not know. And eventually, those who are retracting credibility for Alex are winning out. I'm a little bit confused. Uh, the, the red is one account? Yes. Which has been hacked? No. It was one of three accounts that was hacked, and that has been Resolved. I should have mentioned that that this issue was resolved here. This account was account it was abandoned at that time. So, so he so Alex had three accounts. So the red is three accounts. Again, I did not describe it. No, it is one account, but we know that it is refer Alex said, you know, that's my account has been hacked. Okay. Yeah. Right. So wh what it shows is an attempt by somebody, or actually a collection of different people. We believe actually there are multiple players they are trying to harm Alex. Uh, because of the way they behave, because of the way they're giving the messages. So we're continuing. As uh, uh, Andres said, this is you know, part of what we're doing, but we already have developed a, clear, a clearer 
uh, story about what we observe right here. Um, at that time, I think we should draw the summary and maybe we could get together and start talking about the different things that we learned from, from uh, this experience. Yeah, let's uh, well, so try to play it. Uh, first of all, you know, just to sum up, uh, what we've seen is an increase of violence uh, combined with uh, weakened institutions, uh, combined with adoption of, high ad adoption of social media, led to this kind of form of uh, civic engagement on, on so social media. Um, and one thing that we also talked about was, you know, how citizens uh, form these kind of alert networks. Almost like, it reminds me of like birds, you know, like some birds are chirping and then the rest kind of um, follows. Uh, and then we also presented how this practice spreads geographically um, as the violence starts spreading. And then, you know, how this represents a new element in this kind of uh, information ecosystem. Uh, and then we also presented this uh, phenomena of what we call the curators, citizen curators, uh, who are aggregating information, kind of like operators receiving lots of information and then broadcasting these alarms to everybody. And, and these curators are anonymous. They manage to get prominence and they manage also to get harmed. It's a very interesting play here that we are observing how you know, an anonymous can come up to some prominence and being harmed because anonymity is not always helping you. Although I must say that uh, for, for the interview, the people that I interviewed, one of them, uh, it's actually not anonymous. She, she actually uh, puts her name out and her photo and she, when I ask her if she's worried or not, uh, she said that she's not worried because what she's reporting is kind of like factual information. Uh, you know, things that if there is a shooting outside the street here, you know, lots of people will know it. So reporting that she considers is not, not a problem, while the other people are very anonymous and they try to be, you know, they, they, they try to hide their, their real information. But I bet it's not Alex. You know. <laughs> um, uh, and then, you know, one of the other things that we wanted to, to put forward, the idea that these people, at least one of them, uh, kind of phrase it this way, that they consider themselves as uh, new war correspondents. Uh, they spend countless hours on uh, Twitter working altruistically, uh, but also they want recognition for their work. Um, they also challenge the assumption that technology is neutral, as we saw with the mentioning of the uh, trending topics and Twitter verification accounts. Uh, and also these creators, uh, 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 you know, we can identify them, uh, just like the people living in the cities, through the volume of contributions, as well as through the reputation signals that they accumulate via retweets or uh, follow uh, numbers. Um, but this reputation, as uh, Takis was saying, is fragile and you know, can be challenged uh, by others. Yeah. So with that, uh, that's it. Uh, we just want to thank some of our uh, sponsors. Uh, Microsoft also is uh, been uh, a lot of our collaborators at Microsoft and Wellesley and um, we have gotten a major fund from NSF and I should mention also the uh, great uh, help of my colleague Annie Mustafarai at Wellesley who has been instrumental in doing a lot of this work. Thank, Thank you. you. So we're open for questions if we yes. have time. To what extent do the cartels and their members participate in these social networks, either openly or not openly? That's a great question. Uh, so they are very open on one particular website, which is YouTube. Uh, and I mean, as with anything that I presented here that we talked about, it's really hard to know who is behind anything that you see online, right? Uh, so what we've seen a lot, uh, independent of the research, is that a lot of the cartels, for example, they kidnap one of their opponents and they interrogate them uh, in front of the camera, and then they kill them. But the interrogation is filmed, and they, they, this video is posted on YouTube. Oftentimes, the video includes the beheading or the killing of the person, and obviously, YouTube, in uh, terms of use, uh, don't, don't allow that, so the video gets taken down. Uh, so oftentimes, these videos get reposted on this uh, website called VK, it's like a Russian Facebook, uh, where there is apparently less uh, moderation. Uh, so you can still see some of this. So I will say that the, the cartels are probably primarily trying to use uh, social media as a way of broadcasting their message. Uh, it used to be early on in the drug war that they will leak some of these videos to the major news organizations in Mexico and they, and they, and they will play it. Uh, that no longer happens. 
Uh, so now they're using uh, YouTube for this purpose. Uh, it's unclear on how much they are on things like uh, Twitter and so on. There's a lot of debate and a lot of speculation, but that's been a lot harder to identify. There has been, however, some major accusation that they try very actively to infiltrate this kind of sister, uh, uh, citizen networks. And they, um, it's one of the accusations that happens from time to time in the tweets we read, in which somebody has been accused that they work for this cartel and they work for the other. Within the community, I think also, some cartels, within different communities, some cartels have kind of a better reputation than others. Uh, there, there is one particular cartel which is kind of the, ch the champion of hatred, I guess. They are being hated by mm -hmm. everybody more. So it is, yeah, it's interesting how uh, even the government of Calderon, in some reporting that was, uh, I read a couple of weeks ago in New York, uh, New Yorker, I think, was accused, in quotes, accused that he was trying to attack other cartels, leaving one in charge so that eventually will be an easier target and others say, no, they're actually collaborating and so on and so forth. These news are actually also appearing in the tweets. Yes, Mary. Thanks for the presentation. The question I had, I'm, it's incredibly provocative and persuasive for me to think of a community of actors who are, are really looking out for each other. And then the curmudgeon in me wants to be a bit more cautious and tentative about calling, the, the, calling them a community, and particularly in terms of interpreting retweets as a, um, as a reflection of, of community and, and notoriety within that community, or recognition within that community. So could you just talk a little bit more about how you came to think of it so coherently or cohesively as community? Yeah, I can, I can take that. So it is, um, the, the term community is actually is a technical term when we are recognizing this kind of graphs, and it comes from recognizing a behavior in a subgroup which is more consistent within the group than outside. Given that all of these anonymous people, it's very unlikely that they know, you know, the vast majority of them in person. Plus, we're talking about uh, networks that they have, uh, you know, 50, 60, 100,000, uh, you know, followers. It's unlikely, humanly unlikely, that you know that many people, right, or even remember their, their, their faces. So it has to do more, we recognize communities more on the way they behave. That is, when willingly they're using the same hashtag to report. You know, if you want to report something, you don't necessarily have to use a hashtag. You use a hashtag when you want to say, everybody who's following this hashtag, I want you to know what I'm saying. And that's, that's how, it's through their behavior. It's not a community the same way, you know, that you're getting outside in, you know, uh, Cambridge and your thing. In addition to that, I feel like uh, one, at least to me, one signal of uh, identifying a community is when members of a group identif uh, identify themselves with certain name that everybody agrees on. So I feel like this term of Los Twitteros, to me, in some ways signals this sense of collective uh, group that they, they try to or they feel like they're, they're part of. Um, I mean, that's kind of not universally used, and, but, but I feel like it kind of signals this sense of like we are part of something as a group outside the rest of the people who are not here. Yeah. Last summer there was, uh, <clears throat> from my understanding, anti-violence movement throughout Mexico that was triggered by social media. And I'm wondering if you studied any of that in relationship to the Twitter sphere. Uh, I've been aware of that movement, of course. Uh, I have not studied uh, quantitatively or qualitatively as much as this one. Um, that movement was primarily uh, driven by this poet whose son was killed and was kidnapped and killed. And so there was a big effort around this kind of uh, like basically people who, who, had, who had been victims of the war, uh, they came together and they formed this uh, no more violence kind of movement. And they went around the country, you know, talking to victims and so on. Uh, so I think social media play an important role in, in making this movement more visible. But I think the kind of face-to-face -face interactions and, and the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that they are part of the same, uh, they're victims of the same uh, crimes, they, they brought them together much more than social media will do, but I think social media play a role in, in kind of making this a lot more visible in, you know, outside Twitter. Um, so I, 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 will, I, don't, I don't know how much you can claim that 
social media caused that movement as much as you can say that the, the movement was helped by social media. Well, so actually, yeah, so for example, Alex, the, the hitter that, that uh, Takis uh, looked at, uh, this person started a website that is all about, you know, bringing Mexicans together against violence and so on. So there is a lot of rhetoric in all the tweets that we've seen of this idea of, like, not only reporting things, but also complaining about violence. Oftentimes the complaints go, uh, you know, people who are complain about their governor or the president, or sometimes these people are saying things like, you know, we should stop waiting for the government to do something and we should organize ourselves and do something. Uh, it's really hard to, to, you know, to achieve much just on, on, on social media. And actually one of the interesting things is that I think part of what we're seeing in the past few weeks in Mexico during the election, uh, this movement organized primarily by students on social media trying to fight what they perceive as it's an electoral fraud, I think part of that is, uh, kind of drives on the similar practices that we start seeing that we saw in these different cities around violence. So they see kind of uh, the usefulness of social media to bring their message to the forefront. Um, so the, the work's really extensive and there's a lot of good like mixed analysis and the qualitative uh, interviews is great, but there's one thing that I think is missing that would add a lot of validity to the research, which is uh, looking at geography and looking at it in sort of like maybe doing geocoding, maybe looking at geocoded users to really get an idea of the extent to which these people are actually physically located in Mexico, nice. the extent to which they're located in these metro regions, mm -hmm. and, and sort of you know, assert that this is actually the case because you see Arab Spring stuff and you know, it's mostly Western audiences looking, right. at, looking to them rather than like these people right. on the ground. And the right. same thing happened in Iran, so. I actually started from there because I could tell and I could write a program that would determine the names of the streets um, in uh, you know that particular city and then connecting with Google Maps I could check to see for example this street and this streets actually meet um, you know is it is it a fictitious or it is the all of these uh, accounts the by and large do not report location a few that report give you location the middle of the Atlantic Ocean or Norway or you know the North Pole or things like that they do not you know have their geolocation on However, I stopped doing that because I never found in the beginning any s fictitious um, uh, location in the cities we were seeing. So it seems like they were reporting about the cities. Then very often they would also post a picture. And then I could take a look at the picture and you know, see who else was reporting. When you have many people retweeting the same information about a location and about a city, it's very unlikely that this is not there. Yeah, I will add to that that uh, there are a couple of signals that you can uh, identify as kind of being uh, that they represent that these people are actually in these places. One again is the, the language, the locations, as they mentioned. Like unless you live in the cities, which I have a lot of familiarity with the cities, I know that these locations actually exist. Um, but I, I agree that there's, there's a need for a more systematic analysis of how much of these uh, tweets, how many of these tweets actually come from Mexico. Uh, but from just kind of anecdotal evidence that we've collected through reading tons and tons of tweets, it does seem like the majority are actually from Mexico. And one of the, the challenges, like mentioned, is that it's really hard to find location on tweets. So first of all, the number of geolocated tweets uh, overall on Twitter is like less than 0.1%. It's like really, really small. Uh, the other thing is that, the, again, the location that people set on their profile, um, oftentimes it's not the real location, or sometimes they use a different version of that location. So for example, Justin Bieber's heart is one of the most popular locations uh, on Twitter. So uh, it's really hard to identify that, but you know. You can, you can use Google's, Google's uh, API or Yahoo's API to get up to about 45 to 60% uh, hits. And we're, we're, uh, but not for our group. Oh. Not for our group. Our group is not reporting. We were looking. We were looking at the case of Tijuana at one point and getting uh, up, upwards of that. But we can talk about that later. We, we, I mean, if, if you have some uh, suggestions, we'd love to take okay. them. Yeah. I have a question regarding anonymous sources, and uh, as you said, anonymous sources in this situation became very influential and had a really high impact, but we are aware of many concerns regarding anonymous sources. So there could be many problems with, with them. So do you have 
any conclusion regarding the regulation of anonymous sources uh, in general in this situation and how do we keep the quality of anonymous sources and can you see any perspective of use of anonymous sources in future? Can we believe that we will have anonymous opinion makers in future based on this example? Yeah, I can take that. So um, for the anonymous sources, it's different when you're looking at your own Twitter account and you receive an email, a, a tweet from some anonymous person, and different when uh, hundreds of thousands of people or maybe you know thousands of people actually look at the same thing and they decide to rebroadcast this information the chances are that the more you throw this kind of crowdsourcing principle on the problem the more human eyes look at this information and decide to broadcast it or not the more likely you are that there is some validity with the information you are getting the person who's giving the information the anonymous source itself slowly gains um, reputation. It's not that if you, you know, start an account right now and you start tweeting about, say, narco wars in, you know, pretending you're in Mexico, you will have an audience right away. It's very unlikely that you will have very quickly. Somehow, the community, and I'm using it, you know, in the previous term, has to accept that you have something valuable to say and report your information. So one of the things that we found is that we did not, we, we find things about confirmations and non-confirmations. You know, somebody says, yeah, I confirmed that there is this thing happening right there, and I do not confirm. We do not find too many of the non-confirm in there. So for cases like that, you will never be 100% sure. In, in a few cases, as I said, we try to verify as much as possible with the surrounding information with the surrounding, you know, location or description or the picture or stuff like that. But it seems that when thousands of people think that it, this is worth rebroadcasting and they're not robots, it's not like somebody wrote a program to just broadcast like that. I have many reasons to believe that. Then you have some validity. That's my short answer. But I, I, going back to the question of regulation, uh, this, this has been a very a debated topic in Mexico uh, about this. So one of the states, uh, the state of Veracruz, which is one of the cities that we looked at, um, there was a case where people on social media were claiming that kids were being kidnapped from schools. At the end, it turned out to be not true, or at least seems like most, most things indicate that was not true. But the news spread on social media really quickly. And so what happened is that the parents, when they read this, they left work early, and then they went to pick up their kids and so on. So the government was really upset. And primarily, the, gov the governor actually has a Twitter account. And despite the fact that he was tweeting saying this is not true, people didn't believe him. Partly because he hadn't built a reputation through a long period of time where he engaged in this kind of uh, practice of tweeting and being part of this kind of community of practice. Um, Part of that made it kind of not trust, a not trusted source, despite the fact that he's like the governor. He was very upset about it, as you can imagine. And, and what they did is that they went after some of these accounts. So they identified like 17 accounts that apparently were retweeting or tweeting about this uh, that were the source. And they sent them to jail on the charges of terrorism. And not only that, but they kind of changed the law so that you know, it will be uh, illegal to spread misinformation on social media. And again, in this environment where you don't know what's misinformation and what's not misinformation, it's really complicated. So uh, in general, I, say, I will say that you know, the approach of looking at regulation or using the law as a way to, to kind of uh, control the flow of information here doesn't seem like the best approach. Uh, and this is compared to other cities where the government has taken a more active approach and they have a long-standing, you know, engagement with this uh, Twitter sphere uh, where their tweets and retweets are considered a lot more trusted. Um, so I, I guess just in terms of regulation, I will, I will kind of uh, raise the concern that that not, doesn't necessarily will work. There is another thing that we did not talk about at all, though it, it's because you are still looking at it and it's, it's also important for your question. It has to do with the fact that, let's imagine that you are actually working for a cartel and you are um, you know, having your own tweet account and you can follow by seeing what people are reporting, you could get information about where it is safe for you also and your cartel members to move and where not to move. So you could have this kind of dual purpose. Citizens are using it to save themselves and cartels are using it to actually uh, find out about the movements of their opponents or of the police. This is one you know, heavily debated argument in this 
to its environment. And what we find at the end, you remember the, the brain-like structure I showed you? One of the reasons that you have this kind of connections is that these groups don't exactly uh, agree or trust completely the other friends in the other group. You know, you may have some common connections, but they don't. And from time to time, they start spreading rumors about the other group. We do not know at the end who is telling the truth. All we know is that they're not on the same board. And this is, you know, the thing that if we could figure out, if you could start, you know, binding, you know, finding the ground truth for some of these groups, then you might be able to find for the rest. Yep. Hi. So last year, uh, it was it became public that there were some threats to the people doing narco blogs in Mexico, and they became public, I guess, mostly when the few narco blogs still covering these things or the few mainstream media covering this started posting the pictures of these couple of bloggers that were killed and put on a bridge because of their engagement on blogs. Uh, but looking at it, I mean, just from the inside on Twitter, I have not nev never found like threats posted at least publicly to people like these curators or people who are influential in, on Twitter. And I was wondering, through your analysis or even through the through the interviews done with, with these curators? Like, did any information on threats they have received appear? Uh, so I th think there are two issues here. One is that uh, the kind of things that we are looking at are reports of events that are public. Uh, the, the claims that people have been killed for tweeting or for using social media have actually been related to the use of other websites, not, not Twitter in particular, to pinpoint the hidden locations of the cartels. So I just, I just, I'm just trying to make sure that we separate those two practices. And the one that we're looking at is the practice of reporting events and violence and so on. And that's a lot less, uh, in some ways, dangerous than actually reporting where the cartels are hiding. Um, and that actually is not as active on Twitter. So the fact that you haven't seen it on Twitter as much is because that doesn't happen as much on Twitter as it happens on other sites. So that particular case in Obolaredo where they killed two bloggers was because they actually created a separate website where they kind of had a Google mashup uh, of the Google Maps uh, API and they kind of helped people pinpoint the location of the cartels. And the claim is that some of these people were killed, and but even that is being contested. You know, there were two bodies found. Next to the bodies, there was a sign that said, you know, these people are killed for what they're doing online. Uh, some people say that perhaps they, they were not actually the people involved in the blog, that they were just random people that they killed, and they were trying to kind of demonstrate their power. So it's very murky, and it's really hard to know what's true or what's not true. Um, but in general, I will kind of separate these two phenomena, the one reporting you know, violence that is public and the other one reporting the hidden kind of information. And that's something that I'm personally not as interested in looking at just because it's, uh, you know, a lot more dangerous and more, uh, uh, you know, it's a lot harder to, to analyze because it's just a lot more hidden. Yeah, I agree. Th thank you for your really interesting presentation on your really interesting research. And I know you said that your research doesn't cover this, but I was wondering if you might consider uh, talking a little bit about what you saw as the people who were curators presenting themselves as female. Uh, I don't know how news operates in, in Mexico, but uh, I know in the US it's pretty uncommon to have investigative journalists be female, particularly war correspondents be female. But um, females have historically uh, been people concerned with kinship and, and civic uh, uh, and welfare of community. So I'm wondering if you could kind of talk to how social media might be involved in yeah, that. Yeah, actually, when I asked one of the curators, why do you think that a lot of these people are women? And she said exactly what you were saying, that you know women are more uh, civic or more you know, pro-social in some ways, uh, that's what she said. Um, and th when I asked this same question to other people also, they say that, well, they claim to be woman, women just to gain uh, status and, and trust, but they might not be women. So I think there is this play with gender there that is really interesting and that I think will be really interesting to dive more deeper into that. Yeah, yeah we're thinking exactly of the same thing. Because the overwhelming kind of fake names that you see there are women's names. And you wonder, are they really women? But I guess. One reason is that women naturally might care more about that. The other is that if you're a man and you want to muddle the waters, you say you're a woman. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks.